Good afternoon. It's got the ones that sit in the front don't get questions asked to them, so that's way good. Can y'all can you hear me? All right. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all today. And I know after four hours of lectures, it gets to be a little bit tiresome. But I do think this uh, clinical core at the DMEX is really helpful for you all because it looks like you all are doing really, really well on your in-service examination. So I think it's a very productive thing to do. And I'll try to keep this moving so after four hours of lectures, you won't fall asleep. Uh, and I'm, I had an audience response system built into this thing, but apparently we can't use it. So I'll just call on little groups of people to answer these questions. I hate provocative questions. I'm kind of so black and white. I like yes, no, you know, red, blue, black, white. I don't like gray, but a lot of these are kind of provocative questions just to generate discussion. And what we're talking about today is uh, diverticular disease and its complications. So I used to tell people when I would give lectures when I was a medical student, things were very different now than it used to be when I was a medical student many, many years ago. But now I can say, that even when you are a medical student, things are very different with diverticular disease. And I think this is a very pertinent topic because you can take what you learn from this and go back to the clinic or back to the hospital and apply it in your uh, practice. So a lot of the things that we used to think about diverticular disease, uh, we no longer think. And this is even over the last three to four years. I don't have any conflicts of interest. Um, what we're gonna do today is several things. We're gonna talk about the associated health burden of diverticular disease. We're gonna summarize the present terminology. We're gonna cite the risk factors for diverticulitis. So when you see somebody in your clinic that has diverticular disease and they ask you what I can do or what I don't wanna to do to prevent episodes of diverticulitis in the future, you can tell them. You can also apply appropriate antibiotic use in diverticulitis. You can critique the role of probiotics and fiber you can manage the chronic complications of diverticulitis, diverticulosis, including constipation, bloating, pain. If you need a surgeon, you'll know the appropriate indications for that, and you can also manage patients with diverticular bleeding. Now, all that sounds like a lot in the next 40 minutes, but we'll go, th we'll go through it. Now, the first question of the day is, who is this? Brock Lesnar. Okay, whoever got that right didn't have to get the next question, so that was most of it. <laughs> All right, now why do I have a picture up of Brock Lesnar? Because he became a vegetarian okay. after getting diverticulitis. Yeah. She's, not, she's not a plant down here. I swear I've never met this lady in my life, but <laughs> she's, not, she's not a plant. So the answer was he became a vegetarian after getting diverticulitis. I swear I've never met her in my life. If I have, I don't know. So that's Brock Lesnar, uh, you know, NCAA champion in the heavyweight division from the University of Minnesota went on to the UFC, beat Randy Couture for the title in the UFC, developed, and I'm not his doctor, you know, I wish I was, but I'm not his doctor, so I'm not telling about him. You can pick up GQ magazine or any sports magazine and read about this. Uh, developed complicated diverticulitis with three different episodes. And in this fight, now who, this is, this is Brock Lesnar again. Now who's, who's the guy on the, the left? All right. Uh, somebody had said it was Mosum over on the left, and this was me on the right at the end of a consult week where he was bloodied because he just wasn't getting the job done over there, but that's, that's exactly right. But what Brock Lesnar said is he'd probably be banging heads in the UFC if not for diverticulitis. So this is very truthful. This beast of a guy uh, didn't want to get beat repeatedly in the abdomen because he had had all these surgeries for diverticulitis, went back to, to uh, sports entertainment, the WWE, and then actually went back to the UFC, she has to correct me, was it three, six months ago? Won, won, won his match, but then kind of got into some trouble for some, some medications that happened to be in his system at the time. So what are pocket, what are diverticuli? Well, these are herniated areas, uh, importantly of mucosa and submucosa, that goes through the muscularis mucosa of the wall of the colon. So it's, it's the mucosa and the submucosa that herniates through, and very importantly, these are often at sites of where blood vessels hit the colon, and that's what puts you at risk for diverticular bleeding. Now, I love this article. This is an article by Slack in 1972 out of the British Journal of Surgery, and what he did is he drew this beautiful diagram that I'm going to go over of a diverticulum, 
And if you read the earlier descriptions of diverticulosis, there was a guy named Matthew Bali in Morbid Anatomy, and this is in 1793. And he described these small, fissiform tumors, dark-looking varices, called them varices, in the colon. But I mean, that's like in 1793 that he described diverticula. I think that's pretty good. Now, in 1899, Grosser looked at it, and even in 1899, he provided experimental evidence to show the colon in relation to the diverticuli and these very blood-rich vessels. So think about it. These have been described since the late 1800s, even the association close to these blood vessels. A, a drawing indicating from long ago these complications of diverticuli, including perforation, bleeding, fistulas to the bladder, and obstruction from the diverticuli. And this is what I was talking about. This, this, this is a very blood-rich area with being fed laterally and medially by the blood vessels that break and go around this anti-mesenteric tinea. And if you look at this grossly from a biopsy specimen, you can see stool sticking in the diverticulum at the top picture. You can see these deep pockets pathologically. Then histologically, you see the muscle layer over here in pink and this large, deep crypt with herniation. Now over here at the serosa, right here, as you, in the deep in that pit, as you get older like me, that area breaks down. So that, that would, could possibly alter the microflora of the gut with transmembrane potentials going across. And that's another reason um, that uh, we have problems with diverticuli. Endoscopically, this is what it typically looks like, these pockets that we see in the colon. And radiographically, this is a normal barium x-ray, and you see the smooth contour of the colon with no diverticuli. And here you see all these pockets in the colon. That is a classic on barium x-ray, classic uh, uh, finding in diverticuli. Now there's a filling defect here where the arrow is, and what do you all think that might be? Do what? Stricture? It's not stricture. What could it be? Name me a couple things it could be. Intussusception? Maybe, probably not. What? A what? It can be just a stool. Also. Okay, so it could be stool. What else could it be? Very importantly, what could it be? A mass. Okay, so that filling defect, you can see, it could, that could be a cancer in the middle of those diverticuli, and we'll talk about that in a second. Now, this is diverticuli on a CT scan, and you can see the arrows, which are helpful, but these air-filled areas in the sigmoid colon, as the sigmoid colon goes up, these little air pockets going all the way up. Very high sensitivity and specificity on CT scan for diverticulosis. So the first question, if I had my audience response system, which I don't, that's okay, uh, is an asymptomatic 60-year-old female has a screening colonoscopy and has multiple colonic diverticuli uh, are found. She inquires how many people her age have this finding. So how many say 10%? 30%? 30%. 15%? 20%? Percent. 100%? Okay. I think the answer is C. I think it's 50% because I made up the question. So you have about a 50% chance on a screening colonoscopy when you're 60 years old to finding diverticuli. Now, hospitalization for diverticulitis is most common in Hispanic males, white women, black women, black males, white males, or Hispanic females. Oh, how many say Hispanic males? One. Okay, white women. Okay. Uh, black women. Uh, black males. Okay, white males. Okay, Hispanic females. So the answer is B, it's white women. Highest risk, highest incidence of hospitalization for diverticulitis. And you look, when you get consults or when you admit your patients to the hospital, you look at the amazing preponderance of white women that have this. All right, the patient asked for her lifetime risk of being hospitalized for diverticulitis. Asymptomatic diverticulum, she says, what's my risk of being hospitalized? What do you guys think? 30%? Okay. It's really actually very small. It's less than 
So we used to tell people when we found these that you had probably a 20-30% chance of getting diverticulitis in the future. We now know it's extremely small. So you can tell most of your patients that incidentally have diverticuli that most of the time in their life they're not going to develop diverticulitis. As far as the epidemiology of diverticulosis, the prevalence increases with age. We have a 50% chance at age 60 and over and a 70% chance by age 80. It's much higher in my practice. I think of the people from the United States, not Asia, not Africa, I think over 90 or 95 percent of my patients have diverticuli in East Tennessee when I scope them, so it's much higher here. Now as far as the epidemiology of diverticulosis, we know it's higher in, pre in prevalence in Western and industrialized countries. In Africa and Asia, it's actually very small. So there were studies looking at the UK diet and the African diet, and what they, what they found was that the UK with low fiber, the stool transit time is about 80 hours and the stool weight is 110 grams per deciliter. Uganda, it's increased fiber, stool transit time is about 34 hours and the weight is 450 uh, grams. So it's postulated that because there's slower transit time, the microbiome gets discoordinated and they may increase your risk of diverticulitis. Now, this is older data and we're going to quote a study that, that kind of challenges this before. There's an article in uh, clinical gastroenterology and hepatology uh, several years ago that looked at hospital admissions and this is similar, similar to your wonderful data that you've come up with on uh, complications of cirrhosis and SBP, the same data bank I believe that you used, okay? And so what these investigators did is they looked at the risk of diverticulitis. This is, the first one is diverticulitis, okay? So you see white is the highest population and there's an increasing instance of Native Americans behind that. So that's the first take home message. White, it's not only white, but as the next slide shows, it's white women. So the highest risk of diverticulitis is white women and then men are below that. And we can see that diverticular bleeding is now gone, actually gone down the last few years and it's about equivalent to men. The only thing that, the other thing I was going to say, this is diverticular bleeding. Diverticular bleeding is more of a disease of older people. So you see a very high instance in patients age 70 and 80 years old, but much less instance in people younger than that. Okay, so remember, white women for diverticulitis older people for diverticular bleeding. And the final thing I'll say is that for diverticular bleeding, there's been a higher instance of that in uh, African Americans over the last 10 years. So higher instance of African Americans, high instance in older people. For diverticulitis, it's white women. The other thing that's not shown on this slide, and that's uh, another reason I had a slide on Brock Lesnar, is that just like with rectal cancer, in 40-year-old men, if you have a 38-year-old with rectal bleeding, we used to poo-poo that, maybe do a flex sig. There's been a much higher increase risk of rectal cancers in young men age 40 and less over the last five years. There's also been a higher incidence of virulent uh, diverticulitis in young men age 40 and younger. They tend to develop many more complications, and that's why I had the picture also of Brock Lesnar. Now, the exact mechanism or pathophysiology behind diverticulosis is unknown. It's been postulated that it develops from increased pressure and weakened walls as the mucosa degenerates in age in that area, the vasorecta that I showed you, and also the development of diverticulitis from stool or food lodging in the diverticulum is probably not true. Genetics plays a role. I love twin studies, kind of. Uh, uh, I have twins, but this was a Danish twin study and it's kind of neat. They kept a record of all the twins born since the 1960s. And what they found was there's actually a genetic predisposition to diverticulosis. And it's this gene, and it's implicated in the development of complications if you have diverticuli. They also found that there was a very high incidence from 77 to 96 in twins and even siblings. And what they also found, the thing I really wanted to show you, is age 0 to 39 and 40 to 44, if you look at this group, look at that, a 4.3 and a 7 time instance of diverticulitis and its complications in these, in these probands, okay? So the take home message is if you have somebody young that's in their 40s, 30s, and they're having diverticulitis with a lot of these complications, they probably have a family history of patients with similar problems. 
Motility has been implicated in problems with diverticulitis. You have neural degradation with age in the myenteric plexus and the myenteric glial cells and interstitial cells of Cajal, and this promotes discoordinated movement in the bowel. Uh, other thoughts on it, as far as the microbiome, just like with irritable bowel syndrome, would be long-standing uh, stasis of feces, microbiome dysbiosis, which precipitates a chronic inflammatory state in the gut. So all this is beginning to sound like what? When I'm talking about a chronic inflammatory state in the gut, I'm talking about dysbiosis in the gut. What does that sound like, Dr. Femister? What does that sound like, Allison? I'm talking about dysbiosis. I'm talking about a chronic inflammatory state in the gut. Besides diverticulitis, what does that sound like? Chronic inflammation. Sounds kind of like inflammatory bowel disease to me, right? So people are looking at this overlap uh, in these two diseases. So inflammation is very big in, di in, in inflammatory, in, in diverticulosis. Symptoms of diverticular disease and complications of diverticular disease are all implicated in inflammation. It's been shown that there's an increase in microscopic inflammation, including lymphocytes and neutrophils with enhanced expression of tumor that necrosis factor two, with segmental colitis associated with diverticular disease and a macroscopic finding of chronic inflammation and diverticulitis. So we'll talk about this in a second, but when we say SCAD, you know, I don't know if any of y'all had siblings uh, that went to South Carolina Art and Design School in Savannah, Georgia, but it's not talking about that. Mm -hmm. It's talking about chronic inflammation in diverticulitis. So we need to talk about the proper terminology when you talk about diverticulosis. And I know this seems rote and this may seem boring, but it's only gonna take 30 seconds, but I think you really need to be specific with your terminology. So if we have diverticuli on a screening colonoscopy, all that means is what? You have diverticulosis, right? Okay. Diverticular disease means you have symptomatic diverticulosis. All right, so if somebody comes in with abdominal pain, but they don't have a fever and they don't have a CT showing inflammation in their gut, that is asymptomatic, that's symptomatic diverticulosis. Acute diverticulitis is where you have a diverticulum that has active inflammation in the diverticulum. So on CT, you're going to see peri-diverticular stranding and fat stranding. If you have asymptomatic, uncomplicated diverticular disease, that's where you have diverticuli without any symptoms. And SUD, I really like SUD also. So the two big initials for the day are going to be SUD and SCAD, okay? So SUD is symptomatic, uncomplicated diverticular disease. These symptoms are caused by diverticuli in the absence of inflammation or diverticulitis. The pain may come and go. The pain may be relieved by flatus or bowel movement. You can have bloating, constipation, and diarrhea with SUD, all right? So now you have somebody that doesn't have inflammation. They have no fever. They're completely asymptomatic. And they come to you and they're complaining of nonspecific lower abdominal pain with constipation and diarrhea. What does that sound like? IBS. IBS, right? So you can see these overlaps. So we used to sit there just like with reflux and ulcer disease. We used to be able to say, oh, yeah, that's reflux and this is ulcer disease. But at the end of the day, it all gets very mixed up. And sometimes it all gets, it, it gets tossed into the same trash can. But having said that, at the end of this, I'm going to tell you, sometimes you can treat these symptoms similarly to the way that you treat irritable bowel syndrome. Now, recurrent symptomatic uncomplicated diverticular disease are symptoms of SUD that are occurring multiple times per year. And SCAD, of all of these, I think you really need to know what SCAD is. So SCAD is inflammation in the colon, segmental colitis. It's a chronic form of diverticulitis that can mimic inflammatory bowel disease. And when you look at the colon, you can see inflammation around these diverticuli and it's really, some people even say, a precursor of inflammatory bowel disease. So it's chronic inflammation, uh, on, and on biopsy, I'm sorry, let me go over this algorithm one more time. So everybody understand that? The cares to understand it? Okay. So bottom line, you got diverticulosis. It can be asymptomatic. You go to symptomatic diverticulosis. You can have SUD. You can have diverticulitis, hemorrhage, or segmental colitis associated with diverticulosis. If you do have diverticulitis, it can be complicated or uncomplicated. And then how do you distinguish complicated versus uncomplicated diverticulitis? How is that defined? I'm sorry? Abscess. Exactly. So where the abscess is. So if you have diverticulitis, by definition, you have an abscess somewhere, okay? So in uncomplicated diverticulitis, the abscess is in the wall of the colon. 
If you have complicated diverticulitis, the abscess is outside the wall of the colon, all right? So it's all where the abscess is, okay? Um, if you do have complicated diverticulitis, you can have abscess, fistula, obstruction, or free perforation. All right, our asymptomatic lady that you found diverticuli on on screening colonoscopy would like to know how she could decrease her future risk of diverticulitis. You inform her to do all of the following except. So this is kind of a softball. Okay, y'all got that one, E. All right, y'all didn't even look at the answers. You know it was E. Avoid all nuts and seeds. You know, my partner, Dr. Schmidt, or who works at the VA now, I said, you ought to come to my talk on diverticulosis. I sound like Donald Trump, but I said, it's gonna be great. You're gonna love it. It's gonna be the best lecture in the world. And he said, oh yeah, you're gonna tell him not to eat nuts and seeds, and he just stopped. And I said, I'm gonna tell him more than that. I got 50 minutes. So anyway, so you do avoid nuts and seeds. You decrease weight if obese. You stop smoking. You increase physical activity and you increase fiber and decrease red meat and fat. But to confuse you even more, the last one I'm gonna show you a study that might argue with that. Y'all got 100% on the audience response, that's good. Okay, medications that pose a risk for development of diverticulitis include opioids. 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 Okay, good. And, and these others have been shown to be even somewhat protective, although it's not confirmed, statins, calcium channel blockers, and vitamin D those have been thought to be maybe protective from diverticulosis going on to diverticulitis. All right, fiber and diverticulosis. The classic thinking is that low fiber increases the risk of, of uh, diverticular disease. More recent studies indicate high fiber diet is associated with a higher prevalence of diverticulosis, and there's no association with red meat, fat, or physical activity. This was a study done at the University of North Carolina published in Gastroenterology a couple years ago. And what they did was they took all the people that came in for screening colonoscopies and registered those that had diverticuli on the screening colonoscopy. And you can see the statistics are about age 60 to 69, 50 to 60 percent chance of having diverticuli. And that's basically what the literature supports. So after that, they, they did a telephone interview with all these patients that had screening colons. And what they did is they asked them, what's your physical activity? How much red meat do you eat? Uh, they asked them all this series of questions. And then they did uh, an analysis of it. And what they found was when you took total fiber, whether it was from grains or from fruits or from vegetables, and you took red meat and you took physical activity, there was actually an inverse relationship between the amount of fiber you ate and the amount of diverticuli that you had. So if somebody were to ask you on a, on a test, does high fiber diet prevent diet formation of diverticuli, your answer would probably be no, okay? If somebody were to ask you on a test, once you have diverticulosis, does that prevent you or help maybe prevent you from having diverticulitis, you would probably answer yes, because there is data supporting that and the AGA guidelines and their guidelines say it suggests a high fiber diet, although the evidence is weak in supporting that. So what about diverticular disease? Adherence to a vegetarian diet reduces the risk of hospitalization and death. That was by Crow et al. Nuts, corn, seeds have no increased risk of diverticulosis or bleeding. Take home message, corticosteroids, opiates, non all increase the risk of diverticulitis and diverticular bleeding and obesity and smoking increase your relative risk of diverticulitis. So those are actually things you can tell your patients to do, not that we needed another reason to tell people to lose weight and to stop smoking. There is some evidence su suggesting that the, the protective medications include calcium channel blockers, statins, and high vitamin D levels. So the next question, a 60-year-old male calls Mosum Saturday evening when he was out to dinner with his significant other and he states he's having significant left lower quadrant abdominal pain along with constipation. A routine colonoscopy was done six months ago. This revealed diverticular disease in the sigmoid colon. He has no fever, he has no blood in his stool, so you tell him to A, call back Monday, B, antibiotic coverage for aerobic and anaerobic bacteria, C, go to the ER for an exam, CT and blood work, start a probiotic or order a colonoscopy. So what do you all think about that one? I'm sorry, what? Go to, the ER. Go to the ER. Okay, does everybody like that question? Oh, I mean, like that answer? <laughs> All right, I like that answer. I would tell the patient to go to the ER and get a CAT scan because this is the first time this has happened. You don't have, you know he has diverticuli, but what else could it be? 
I mean, it could be a urinary tract infection, it could be a perforated diverticulum, it could be appendicitis, it could be Crohn's, it could be colon, it could be a thousand things. So I don't think just putting him on antibiotics over the telephone, I think you're leading, leading yourself over for a lot of second guessing. All right, so Mosum's out on the town again. He's at Club 5050 living it up watching a soccer match. And the same patient calls back again eight weeks later and he states he was diagnosed with uncomplicated diverticulitis and responded to Cipro and Flagyl when he was sent to the ER. It's Sunday night, he has some nonspecific abdominal pain which is mild and loose stool for a few days. He really liked those antibiotics you called in and he wants you to call in some more, all right? So Mosum tells him to stop bothering him and call me tomorrow when my, my uh, peer's on call. You call him in some more antibiotics, shorter a stat CT scan. You agree to see him in the morning and check a CBC and, uh, and clinical examination in the morning. So what do you all think about that? See him in the morning. And somebody likes calling him in more antibiotics. Okay. Again, this one, I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer, but I mean, I probably would have seen him in the morning. I think that's okay. Everybody's always hesitant to say that because it makes you look like you're lazy. But he has no fever. He has no warning signs. So I think it's okay probably to see him in the morning. Now, what, what could that be? Possibly. Could it be post-diverticulitis irritable bowel syndrome? Could it be scud, SUD? Could it be SCAD? Could he have C. diff from the antibiotics? Or could it be any of those things? So it could be any of those things. And it, but there's no harm in seeing him the next morning. My thing is, you know, I often see patients, and it's easier for me to judge, right? But I often see patients that, I've see, that have seen their primary care and then called in like at 1 in the morning, midnight, 2 in the morning. And they've been on like three or four rounds of antibiotics, and they don't even have a CT showing that they got diverticulitis. But they get so persistent about it. You know, they act like you're just worthless if they ask you for these antibiotics and you don't call them in. So it's a hard thing to do, but I think that's, that's the right answer. Now, the signs and symptoms of diverticulitis can be mild or severe, intermittent or unrelenting, fever, change in bowel habits, hemesis, constipation, diarrhea, nausea, and urinary symptoms. The differential diagnosis would be ulcerative colitis and Crohn's can present in this manner. Ischemic colitis, now a typical history for ischemic colitis is somebody calls you on the telephone, they're constipated, they have severe lower abdominal discomfort, and then they pass blood, and then they start having bloody diarrhea. So that's typically ischemic colitis. Appendicitis, again, significant abdominal pain, which over a period of time migrates, and even irritable bowel can present in this way. The diagnosis of diverticulitis rests on CT scan of the abdomen, which is the gold standard to diagnose and treat this. CT and CT colography can judge the extent of disease and complications, and the sensitivity of a, of a, uh, a transluminal uh, imaging, cross-sectional imaging, is about 94%, and the specificity of the CT scan is about 99%. So if you have a patient that has a CT and it doesn't show diverticulitis, they probably don't have it. Now, when we're on rounds at the hospital, I don't think we really use this classification enough. You know, we say this, we go look at the CT, the CT says, oh, yeah, it's diverticulitis, there's no flag, there's no abscess between on some antibodies. But actually, the radiology literature breaks this down really nicely with the Buckley classification. So mild disease by the Buckley classification shows bowel wall thickening and fat stranding. Moderate disease shows bowel wall thickening with a greater than three millimeter thickening with phlegmon and small abscess. And severe disease is defined as bowel wall thickening greater than five millimeters with perforation with subdiaphragmatic free air and an abscess greater than five millimeters. So if you have this last category, that is a bad thing, okay? There's very high mortality rates. Some people say the mortality rate from free air under the diaphragm with the perforated diverticulum is close to 19 to 20%. So that's a pretty big deal. Now the Hinkey classification is also helpful. I like the other one better, but this is helpful. This stage one is pericolic abscess and phlegmon. Stage two is pelvic and intra-abdominal or retroperitoneal abscess. Stage three is purulent peritonitis, and stage four is fecal peritonitis. So again, these people are pretty sick by the time they get to stages three and stages four. So this is a CT scan showing uncomplicated diverticulitis of the sigmoid colon with some fat stranding. This is the sigmoid. You have a little bit of fat stranding over here. These are the diverticuli, and you have no evidence of abscess. You just have some bowel wall thickening, some fat stranding around the sigmoid colon. So that would be mild disease. Uncomplicated diverticulitis is pretty easy to treat. It's bowel rest. Uh, there's actually studies now questioning the efficacy, if it's very mild disease, of even using antibiotics. 
Moderate to severe, you need intravenous antibiotics. And again, there was a British randomized trial in patients with uncomplicated diverticulitis that found antibiotics provided no change in complications, hospital stay, or recurrent diverticulitis. And the new AGA guidelines actually state they suggest, quote, selective use in your patients. But I'm not that brave sometimes. I mean, I'm always worried that, you know, if I see somebody that has some mild diverticulitis and I don't use antibiotics and they go on, you know, I've, I've jumped 20 years in the future and they've taken my children's houses and everything from the malpractice suit I lost. So, so sometimes, you know, it, it, if, if you have mild diverticulitis, most of the time I still treat patients, but I think just for test taking purposes, it's good to know that uh, uh, you don't really have to do that. Now, complicated diverticulitis, like we were talking about before, would be an abscess outside the wall of the colon, and this can present with phlegmon, peritonitis, obstruction, fistula, bladder and hip infections, and hepatic abscesses. So the portal vein drains this area, and so you can get an abscess in the liver pretty easily, and that's also close to your hip. So I've seen infections in hips from diverticulitis also. Complicated diverticulitis is surgical management. Up to 16% of the time, you can do a perk drainer surgery. A hinky stage B and two, up to 50% success by radi radiographic drainage. Single stage versus Hartman patch, pouch for failure. So in the surgical literature now, uh, before people that had complicated diverticulitis, it was a three-stage procedure where they would get a resection, a pouch, and then a reanastomosis. So there are studies now looking at laparoscopically going out and resecting that part of the colon and doing a primary reanastomosis to save the patient a couple other surgeries. And the early data on that suggest it may be equivalent to a Hartman's pouch in a three-stage procedure. Perforation with peritonitis is bad. It's very, very, very bad. It, that only happens one to two percent of the time, but it's very bad. If you have that, you have, in some studies, say up to a 19 percent chance of death. Fistulous tracts, for test-taking purposes, always pop up on every test you'll take for the rest of your life, so you have to know it. So these tracts can go to the vagina, they can go to the bladder, they can go to other parts of the bowel, and it's just like Crohn's disease, they can go to, other, to, to just everywhere. If you have complicated disease, you have higher rates of readmission for this. All right, so this is a barium enema of a patient that had diverticulitis three months ago, and they came in complaining of increasing constipation. So what is the differential diagnosis on this imaging study? Okay, what do you see, number one? Okay, very good. So you see a stricture in the sigmoid colon here, right? So that could be cancer, or that could be an inflammatory stricture from the diverticulitis, okay? Are you gonna stick a scope in there and look? I'm probably not. I'm probably going to send that patient to surgery because I could pop it, and then the other thing that could happen is either way, I think they're going to surgery with that stricture, okay? My opinion. All right, this patient presented with diverticulitis and uh, told you went to the bathroom and started having air when he urinated. He had pneumaturia. So what's the diagnosis? Okay, where's it going to? The bladder. And how do you know that from this step? Do. They're all over that. Okay, so there's air. The black stuff is air in the bladder here, right? Okay, very good. Y'all are getting all these right. So this, this is just a diagram of somebody that has a complicated abscess. This is the diverticulum and all these pockets here are abscesses with a lot of inflammation. And this would be hard to distinguish from diverticulitis. This is a right lower quadrant hyper-enhancing diverticulum with inflammation around it this right-sided diverticulitis, which would be hard to distinguish. And this is a patient that has an abscess there that's drained percutaneously there, and the drain is pulled, and he, he's better. So the radiologists do a great job draining these abscesses. Uh, this is a patient that had actual a free wall perforation, and you can see the diverticuli here, and this tract going through the fat, and there's some narrowing on barium x-ray there, and that may be secondary inflammation, or that could be a cancer sitting in the sigmoid colon. All right, this patient came in with about a week's history of um, severe abdominal pain. He wasn't treated with antibiotics, and then he started having significant vomiting and was admitted to the hospital. And so this is the, C the, C the, the flat plates on the right and the CTs on the, I'm sorry, 
The CTs on my right, the flat plates on the left. Vomiting, fever, after a week of untreated diverticulitis. So what do you think that looks like? Do what? A mega colon? Okay, so do you think that's colon up there? Or do you think that's small bowel? I think it's small bowel. So I think he's got a small bowel obstruction with these big, I don't, big tenia. I don't see hostile markings, so I see the circular tenia of the small bowel. And then over on the right is a CT scan showing an abscess in the middle and an air fluid level out of one of those loops of dilated small bowel. So it, they can also present with small bowel obstruction. Now this patient uh, came in with diverticulitis and noted some purulent drainage coming out of their skin on their left flank. So what is this? Right, so it's an enterocutaneous fistula. And then, whoa, and then this patient, sorry. This patient had a fistula going to the small bowel, again, indistinguishable from Crohn's disease. So SCAD is something I think you need to know about. It's chronic colitis involving areas of diverticuli. You have erythema uh, around the diverticuli. You typically don't get after the ulcers. Uh, you can have uh, a chronic colitis. There's typically rectal sparing. And if you have abdominal pain with it and diarrhea, mesalamine preparations can be used just like you're treating inflammatory bowel disease. And this is something for your gastroenterologist to diagnose. But I did want you to see this. Here you can see the periverticular inflammation up here, the redness. And this doesn't really look a whole lot different than Crohn's disease. And this is, if I showed this microscopic exam to you, the crypts are supposed to be lined up with the goblet cells in, in, in good form going straight across. So there's architectural disarray and there's a chronic inflammatory state at the base. All these are inflammatory cells here. And so if I did this biopsy and there's actually, what's this? That's a microabscess. Okay, so there's no granulomas, but what does that sound like? Inflammatory bowel disease. So if, if I showed this to Dr. Sherbaji, he would have a very difficult time distinguishing SCAD from inflammatory bowel disease. They look, they look the same. And this is a stain just showing the inflammatory infiltrate. So the complications of diverticular disease include lower health-related quality of life, irritable bowel syndrome, depression, anxiety, chronic abdominal pain, anticipatory anger, and frustration. This was a study out of clinical gastroenterology and hepatology published several years ago. And what they did is, again, they looked at the VA database this time, the VA database. And they went back about 10 years and they picked an index case of diverticulitis. And then they followed them after that. And what they found was this big, big jump in mood disorders and depression after their episode of diverticulitis. They also had a new diagnosis of functional bowel disease and also a new IBS diagnosis. So again, there's some, there's some relationship between the gut and the brain, just like an irritable bowel or just like when you have an infection with Salmonella or Shigella, down the road you can get a post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. The same thing can happen with diverticulitis. Now, criticism of this study would be you're taking this out of the data bank, and how do you specifically know when they were depressed or when they were anxious or when they had their anticipatory fear? But I think it does stand. So what about the prevention of diverticular disease and recurrent diverticulitis? Well, surgical resection is the only true cure a recent Kaiser study said 86% are symptom-free over nine years after initial diverticulitis without anything. Only 4.7% have recurrences beyond two years, and the risk of complicated after uncomplicated is only 5% after eight years. The other thing I want you to take home with you is, previously we suggested that you had surgery for your diverticulitis after two episodes of, of diverticulitis. And there was a recent uh, Mark Markov's model where it looked at surgery versus conservative therapy, and it also threw in there treating patients empirically with rifaximine and probiotics. And out of all these, these, these uh, uh, areas, only the third one was proven to be, uh, surgery was proven to be equivalent to medical only after the third episode of diverticulitis, okay? So, and even then, they had less pain if you treated them medically instead of going to surgery. So again, in the old days, what we used to say is two episodes of uncomplicated diverticulitis or one episode of complicated diverticulitis, you went to surgery, okay? And now the take home message of that is it's the patient's choice of if they wanna have surgery or if they don't wanna have surgery. So decreasing recurrent attacks, the AGA guidelines say, 
increase fiber, although there's weak evidence to do that, inadequate evidence for 5-ASA, inadequate evidence for rifaximine, and if you put them on a probiotic and balsalazide, that helps some constipation and pain. The other very important thing to take uh, away from this is anytime you see a patient with diverticulitis, they need a screening colonoscopy four to eight weeks after that episode has resolved. Out of every 67 cases of CT scans showing diverticulitis, there was a colon cancer sitting there that wasn't seen on the CT scan. So when I gave a lecture a couple years ago on colon cancer screening, I said one of the big risks for missing a colonic malignancy or an advanced adenoma is severe diverticular disease, and this further strengthens that point. Now, the question is, when is a recent colonoscopy? And I don't know the answer to that. So if you had somebody that had a colonoscopy last week and got diverticulitis this week, is that recent enough? Yeah, I think so. What about six months ago? Yeah, I think so. What about a year ago? I don't know. I thought I did a good job with it. I've never missed a colon cancer, but what about five years ago? Well, definitely. So there's a gray zone there that if you had a good one a year ago, do you repeat it, okay? And then the other question I have for you you know, is a couple times in my career, I had patients that came in with diverticulitis about a week after I did a colonoscopy on them. So is colonoscopy a risk factor for diverticulitis? I didn't know this until I, you always learn by preparing a lecture, right? So I didn't really know this, but uh, I would always say, ah, you had diverticulitis, didn't have anything to do with me, but yeah, it did have something to do with me. Cause there are, stu there are case reports Pull literature suggesting that it probably does increase your risk of diverticulitis after you have a colonoscopy. So last three slides, we're going to talk about massive GI bleeding, okay, or lower or, or GI bleeding associated with severe, severe gastrointestinal bleeding. And they'll ask this on your board all over the place, okay, just all over the place. So the biggest cause of severe lower GI bleeding is the colon. That's followed by the upper GI tract 17% of the time and the small bowel 5% of the time, and no sources identified 3% of the time. So the majority of the time, massive lower GI bleeding is coming from the colon. Now I know you're gonna look at this and say, oh my gosh, but, but this is, this is the, the skinny on the whole thing. And this is where I get confused because when I look at the MKSAP, when I'm trying to put your board review together for you, I even get mixed up sometimes because it's not always what I would do. But the bottom line is it's 10 o'clock at night, somebody comes in with massive this is out of Schlesinger and Fortran, Jennifer. So this is massive lower GI bleeding, okay? So the first thing you do is, you know, on any test you ever take or any patient you ever see, obviously the first thing you do is stabilize the patient, right? So you do that. Next thing you do is you drop a nasogastric tube, all right? Now, do you need to drop a nasogastric tube on somebody that had coffee ground emesis six hours ago? No. Okay, if somebody's having bright red blood parectum, it never hurts to drop an NG tube to make sure it's not a brisk upper GI bleed. If they have a history of cirrhosis, ulcers, melana, or hematemesis, obviously if they're vomiting bright red blood, they need an EGD or even go deeper with a, upper, with a colonoscope by the upper tract. So the bottom line on all these questions when you take the board is if you have a massive lower GI bleeder, they want you to make sure that you're not missing a duodenal ulcer with a visible vessel they want you to make sure that you're not missing esophageal varices, okay? So you have to do that. So say that's negative, the next thing you would do would be, is there a history of hemorrhoids, pelvic abdominal surgery, radiation, or colitis? So Dr. Femister and I were on call about a month ago, and a guy just had, it was like a hose, it was crazy. I mean, it was just streaming out of his rectum. And he would had had a history of hemorrhoids, so we did a quick flex sig on him, and he had a fissure, and it was actually arterial bleeding from a fissure, and I've never seen that in my career. So the surgeon came in and fixed that. So you can look at perianal things. Finally, if there's no identifiable risk factors for painless hematochesia, this algorithm, and this is from the uh, UCLA CURE study, says you're supposed to do a, quote, rapid purge, clean the colon out, and do a colonoscopy. So I think the way we do it in our practice is mainly that way, but sometimes if there's an older person and they're just bleeding out, what we like to do, you always get a surgery consult, what we like to do is to do a um, RBC tag study to see if it's arterial and it can be embolized. So at the medical center at least, they won't do an angiogram before an RBC tag study. Label the RBCs in the blood, see if it's spilling out, and that tells them where they can do the angiography at. 
So that's the only difference. Sometimes we cheat a little bit if they're very unstable and go to an RBC tag before we prep them for a colonoscopy. And that was Jensen's literature suggesting the rapid colon purge from the UCLA study. And these are the last couple, last two slides is, this is an angiogram where you have spillage of the contrast over here and you can see the interventional radiologist put coils there to stop the bleeding. Now the other thing is we typically love to use clips on these bleeding sites. The literature says you can use a heater probe and epinephrine in the colon, but that scares me because you get transmural burns in the colon from the heater probe. So we love these clips. They stay there for a couple months, longer sometimes, and then they just fall off. So to summarize, the things I want you to remember would be diverticular disease is found in 50% of individuals older than age 60. It's increasingly seen in younger patients with more severe disease and complications. Just like rectal cancer is being seen increasingly in males under the age of 40, the same is true with diverticulitis and its complications. When you scope a or when you have a patient in your clinic that has diverticulosis and they say, what can I do to prevent my risk of diverticulitis? You can tell them to stop smoking, lose weight, stop your non stop your narcotics, and stop your corticosteroids. And I know what you're saying, then they'll find another doctor after that, right? But that's, that's what you can do. Mild diverticulitis may be treated without antibiotics, but nobody could criticize you for ever using antibiotics for diverticulitis. And surgery is no longer mandatory after two episodes of diverticulitis. The role of fiber in preventing diverticulitis is unclear, although the current AGA guidelines recommend increasing fiber if you do have an episode of diverticulitis. And the lingering effects after an episode of diverticulitis may include chronic inflammation, uh, abdominal pain, irritable bowel syndrome, depression, and anxiety. And most diverticular bleeding stops on its own. It's greater than 95% of the time the bleeding stops on its own, but if it doesn't, you know, you can, you can have good help from your radiologist. Last thing I'll say, besides Happy Thanksgiving, is I think when you have these patients, so if you all know, you've seen, you've read it and you've seen the commercials on TV of the colon just going crazy and stuff like that. So before that, there was literature on rifaximine at a dose of 550 TID for diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome and bloating. So if patients, is if it's covered by insurance, a lot of times in my practice for this bloating, nothing helps. So we'll put patients on rifaximine for a couple weeks, do it maybe four times a year. The same can be done for this post-diverticular irritable bowel type symptoms where you give an empiric trial of rifaximine, it's not absorbed systemically, and there's minimal toxicity with it. So I think there's a role for that in this post-diverticular irritable bowel syndrome. Having said that, I know it's time for you all to start your clinics, but are there any questions? Exactly. So the, so the management for SCAD, they recommend no surgery in those people because they're, they're worried that it may be a precursor of Crohn's disease. So I think mesalamine, which is a 5-ASA derivative, is definitely okay to use. I wouldn't go to steroids and things like that, but I think mesalamine would be, would be very appropriate and you don't want to operate on those people. And also I think there's a role for probiotics and rifaximine in that population that treat underlying IBS with it. You should keep lifelong mesalamine on that? I don't know about lifelong anything in my, unless, you know, what I would do is always do things for about a year and stop it and then see if they have recrudescent symptomatology with it. There's really no, there's a very rare instance of, of renal toxicity. I've only seen it once in my career with mesalamine. So, any other questions? All right, I appreciate your time. I hope you have a good afternoon. Yes. Since it's confusing to, like, you know, at least histologically to dis differentiate between SCAD and uh -huh. IBD, right. like, do you, you rely can do on... 
Yeah, what you can do, I didn't talk about that, but that's a great question. If you're confused, what you can do is order serology. Serology, Marcus. Besides the Ask and Yank, if you do the Answer Prometheus panel, it gives you like 50 different things. Okay. So the way that that's helpful is if I have a patient that it looks like I'm trying to distinguish the two, mm -hmm. if those markers are negative, it's probably more diverticular. Yeah. That's you're right. welcome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hey. Yes. Uh, they have, uh, I, I wrote down that uh, segmented colitis yes. with associated and then with uh, SUDD, this uh, uh, symptom uh, yeah. yeah. So they have mentioned that low fiber diet is not good for those patients. It doesn't. 